All right, let's see what we can make of the hysteric. And notice how we've been working this here. On one side of the equation, we've got the university doing the work of the master and all the different ways that we can understand that. And on the other side, you've got Lacan's hope that the discourse of the analyst would be more united with that of the student, which would be more united with that of the hysteric. So you got the hysteric and the analyst on one side, and you've got the university and the master on the other. And you heard me say that the university does the work of the master. That's, you know, roughly speaking, I think we can say that. On the other side, you heard me say that the discourse of the analyst is what activates the hysteric. And you can't help but wonder, given what you've heard in this series so far, whether Lacan is playing that part for his students, hystericizing them, or whether he himself is performing that of the hysteric. The question of hysteria and what Lacan is doing in the classroom, in the lecture hall, from behind the podium, is a really good one for us. Nevertheless, our goal here is just to begin understanding the discourse of the hysteric with these preliminary chapters in Seminar 17. Here's what it looks like. What you have in the discourse of the hysteric is you have the barred subject addressing the S1, producing an S2, while the truth of objet A lies underneath. Let's go through these terms, each of them, one at a time. The barred subject in the position of agent is just that, the barred subject. Ah, uh, but Lacan wants to point out, and he does very clearly at the start of Seminar 17, that in this dominant position, the position of agent, yeah, we see the barred subject, but we see the barred subject as symptom. The dominant position in the master is the law. The dominant position in the analysis is the reject. And the dominant position in the case of hysteria is the symptom. It's a great way to figure out what he means by the barred subject there. S1 is a little more complicated. The addressee, the person or the structure or the position to which the, histor the hysteric in their discourse addresses themselves. S1 is anyone who purports to be the master. Anyone who pretends to be in charge, that's going to garner the attention of the hysteric. But I want to be more precise than that. It's also anyone whom the hysteric can position as master. And I want to put this a bit archly to start. The hysteric is always looking for a master. And when they can't find one, they'll make one in order to do the job of the discourse of the hysteric. Which brings us to the S2. The production in the discourse of the hysteric, Lacan labels it S2. Now, typically we know that as knowledge, and if we think more precisely, we know it as the knowledge process. Here, however, in the discourse of the hysteric, S2 is not knowledge, but ignorance which is in many ways knowledge's most elaborate form. But ignorance is what is produced, revealed, disclosed in the discourse of the hysteric. And it ain't the hysteric's ignorance. We'll see that somewhere else. It's the ignorance of the master. It's the ignorance of anybody who purports to be in charge. It's their lack that the hysteric seeks to reveal. Final term, fourth term, in the discourse of the hysteric, the little a in the position of truth, underneath the dominant position of the agent, qua barred subject, qua symptom. Little a here is the wild card, as we're going to see. First and foremost, the discourse of the hysteric is diametrically opposed to that of the university. What the university conceals, occludes, rationalizes and justifies, namely the master, the capitalist, is the very thing that the hysteric calls into question. What the university serves, the hysteric interrogates the master, or better, the position of mastery. The hysteric doesn't just call this motherfucker into question, though. 
the hysteric calls the master to task, compelling them to admit their own ignorance. And if you want to be simple about this, but in a way that's very revealing, it can just be ignorance about how things work. When you recall that the slave knows how things work, but the master only wants to know that things work, the hysteric at a very basic level shows up and says, admit it. You're a dumbass consumer with no idea of where your shit comes from, how it was made, whether it was justifiably sourced, and so on and so forth. The hysteric is the protester who absolutely calls out the master as an idiot consumer. And maybe idiot isn't quite the right word, right? The idiotas is just somebody who leads a private life. Idiots aren't dumb. The master, though, is ignorant, and it's that ignorance that the hysteric seeks to reveal, seeks to produce by calling the master out, calling the master to task, forcing them to admit that in the field of knowledge, they come up short, they come up lacking, which is, again, why the discourse of the protester in the West has so often been that of the hysteric. They call the master out, they call the master to task, and they reveal the master to be lacking. The emperor is wearing no clothes. This is what Lacan means when he says the hysterics discourse is what leads to knowledge. You'll recall this from page 23 of Seminar 17. The discourse of the hysteric does not embody a desire to know. That goes elsewhere. The discourse of the hysteric shows a propulsion toward knowledge. It leads to knowledge, not the desire for knowledge. The discourse of the hysteric leads to knowledge, is what Lacan says on page 23. And here it's to knowledge as a process, specifically an open-ended, incomplete, arcaded, barred process. In other words, knowledge as a process in which lack, not plenitude, is paramount, foundational, and irreducible. So you've got two understandings of knowledge here again. There's that of the university, where knowledge is established, where knowledge is phantasmagorically rendered as whole, complete, epistemology and the like. It's disciplinary knowledge that the university fetishizes. And what the hysteric is doing is always calling that knowledge into question and revealing that, in fact, that knowledge is always lacking. It always has a hole in it. There's always something missing from the university's claim to have omniscience. That's what I mean when I say the discourse of the hysteric reveals knowledge as a process, an open-ended process, the way that Lacan is talking about the knowledge process here at the start of Seminar 17, where lack, not plenitude, is the name of the game, where something's always missing. I think this is why Bruce Fink's reading of the later Lacan's return to hysteria is correct, by the way. True scientific discourse, as discourse that is always at and about the limits of what we know, is fundamentally that of the hysteric. This is how Bruce reads the later Lacan's return to the discourse of the hysteric, is that it's properly scientific discourse, radically scientific discourse, which is different from the discourse of the university. If the university traffics in epistemological fantasies of certainty, self-identity, and completion, the hysteric reveals all of these as just that, fantasies. It's uncertainty and incompletion, not their phantasmatic opposites, that characterizes true scientific inquiry as part and parcel of the knowledge process. So that's really crucial here. On the side of knowledge in a traditional closed understanding, you have the discourse of the university. On the side of knowledge though as a process 
that is open-ended and always up-ended, that is always chomping at a limit, knowledge that is truly inquisitive, curious, knowledge that is always at some basic level ignorant, which is why, again, you want to find that university professor that can say those three magic words, I don't know. Because it's those magic words that make the life of the mind worth living. The problem is that the university discourse never says those magic words. It always has an answer to every question the students pose, or at least it performs that knowledge. On the other side, though, you've got the discourse of the hysteric that undermines that knowledge, that points to the hollow around which it is structured, its constitutive lack or ignorance or blind spot, not as a problem, but as an opportunity structure, as an opportunity structure for something that is truly and radically scientific, a form of inquiry in which knowledge is revealed to be a process. And that ain't a problem. That, in fact, is the solution. But let me be a little more precise. Fuck united theories of everything. This is what hysterics say and do. Yet another reason why Lacan ends his previous seminar, Seminar 16, on the topic of set theory. Notably, the mathematical fact that every set, no matter how complete, no matter how full, contains the empty set, and there can only ever be one. The set in which nothing appears. The set that marks a place of lack, the place of lack, in any given system. Now, you can go back and you can check out our final lectures on Seminar 16, and you can read along and you can see those passages where Lacan is very clumsily, although I think quite cleverly, working his way into post-Cantorian set theory and really trying to understand how the empty set is a necessary included subset in every other set. It's math, it's set theory, but it's there for you if you want it. Why do that, though, when you've got such a nice quip from Bruce Fink, my brother from another mother, on this point? In the Lacanian subject, check it out. The whole is not whole because it contains an unfillable hole. That ain't bad. In typical fashion, you get a nice, clear way of understanding what's going on here. Every knowledge system, although it purports to be whole, if you ask the professor, is in fact unwhole because holed out. It's the best way to be holy, if you ask me. Nevertheless, I want to admit, this is about as far as I go with Fink's reading of the hysterics discourse. And for me, the issue arises around what Bruce says is its truth. That wild card, that objea in the position of truth. Fink identifies this little a with the real, which makes good sense when we recall Lacan's designation of objea as the reject at the start of seminar 17. And his association, don't forget, of objea with the empty set at the end of seminar 16. So I'm not calling bullshit here. I just want to give the screw one more turn. Objea, in all four of the discourses, if you think about it, is that which doesn't work, which doesn't fit, which structurally contradicts in any given subset of the big barred other, any given S2. It's tempting. It makes a lot of sense as the real. The hysterics discourse leads to knowledge as a process because, as Bruce puts it, its hidden motor force, he's talking about the truth here, this objea, beneath the dominant position of the symptom of the barred subject, is a real reject, a sight of this impossible void, 
around which every S2 is structured. I think that makes a lot of sense and you could do worse than to stop there and have some pretty good insight into how that wild card operates in the discourse of the hysteric as a real reject. But I wanna take this idea of rejection, real rejection, and maybe refer to it something a little differently, maybe like a real withholding or a withholding of the real. Let's think about this for a second. I think you could stop here and be good. You can just hit pause and move on. But I think we could also go a little bit further than this. More than knowledge or its incompletion, what the hysteric enjoys, if we can say that, is feeling like they are the missing part in any given system. The one thing that if only the hysteric would allow it, and they won't, would allow for the system's completion. That is the objea in the position of truth. For this reason alone, I'm tempted to locate hysteria as a clinical structure midway between obsessional neurosis and perversion. And honestly, way more inclined toward the latter than the former. The hysteric, think about this, like the pervert, believes that the big other can be made to exist. Here's that part that I'm alluding to around the S1. If the hysteric can't find a master, it'll lure one into existence. This is what I'm indexing here. Pursue this comparison a little further. The pervert and the hysteric, they both believe that it's them, they themselves, who can bring this completion to pass. They both believe that they're the ones who can make the big barred other whole, that can make the big other exist, as Lacan puts it in Seminar 16. But check it out. What the pervert freely gives in hopes of making the big other exist, the hysteric carefully withholds in order to better reveal the big other for what it is and always shall be, a big barred other, one among many and nothing more. There is not a real rejection, but a real withholding that I think is more indicative of what's happening in the discourse of the hysteric around that objea in the position of truth. Make no mistake though, the hysteric as much as the pervert is what Lacan well describes in seminar 16 as a keeper of the faith. Yeah, the pervert gives themselves as object of jouissance for the big barred other. Yeah, the hysteric knows or fantasizes themselves as the thing that if she were to give herself to the big barred other like that would bring it jouissance. Recall our series on seminar 16 here. But in each case, they are both keepers of the faith. If God is dead, but he doesn't know it, the pervert wants to bring his ass back to life, while the hysteric wants to remind him of that ignorance. There's another difference here between the pervert and the hysteric. I'm not allowing hysteria, in other words, to slide over into the clinical structure of perversion, but I'm telling you, it edges in that direction. It's inclined toward perversion in this way. Yeah, God is dead. Yeah, he doesn't know it. And of course, the problem is he don't go to church, which we'll come to in a second. But what's different here is that the hysteric, unlike the pervert, doesn't want to bring God back to life, but just to remind that motherfucker that he's dead, to remind him of what he doesn't know. In other words, to continually reveal the master's ignorance. If the pervert says that God doesn't have to go to church because there is no other of the other, which is to say, there is no God for God to worship, and so why would God go to church? If you've heard our series on 16, you know this riff. 
The dilemma of God, the danger of God is not that he's sadistic. It's that he's got no place to worship. When Lacan says there is no big other of the big other, if the big other is going to exist, that leaves God in a real bind because he can't go to church. He can't worship. He can't do the very thing that the big other is always asking us to do, to subjugate and subjectify before them. The pervert readily accepts that God doesn't have to go to church because there is no big other of the big other that the pervert seeks to establish. But the hysteric, let's be clear, insists on taking God to school instead, if only so that God can learn, but not from professors, mind you, that the other doesn't even exist in the first place. That's where we land with the discourse of the hysteric, at least for now as a preliminary opening move on the topic.